guys hear me? Good morning, good morning. Yeah? Good. You guys can hear me. Awesome. So by way of introduction, I guess uh, seeing as everybody's having some food and drink this morning, some people have their laptops and mobile devices out. No, it's good. I like to see that. Um, so my name is Ryan Leslie. Um, to give you some super quick background, my parents are immigrants and uh, they, uh, they both work for the Salvation Army. So I don't know if you're familiar with it, but most people know Salvation Army from its awesome thrift stores. They also have adult rehabilitation centers, boys and girls clubs, collaborations with the boys and girls clubs, et cetera. And even though they feel like they have led extremely rewarding lives, they raised me and my sister on about 800 bucks a month. Um, and so my dad, when I was really young, said, hey, look, you know, I don't have any money, so when I retire, you're gonna have to have a lot of money to take care of me and uh, your mom. And so the pathway that he designed for me to be able to make a lot of money, to be able to take care of me and my mom, was education. And so he said uh, when I was super young that he wanted me to be as educated and well prepared for the American dream as humanly possible. And so by the age of 14, uh, I got accepted to Harvard. By 15, I was a freshman there. By 19, I was a senior. And then uh, you know, I graduated and I gave my diploma to my dad to put on his wall in his office so that I could actually pursue my own life's dream of actually being a content creator, if you will. Uh, so I wanted initially to really just do music for a living, and uh, he was pretty confused about that because basically he had groomed me my entire life to be like some, you know, academic prodigy. And uh, I decided that I wanted to be broke and do music, right? So uh, in any case, uh, a lot of twists and turns happened in my life, uh, which I guess eventually put me on this stage in front of you guys today. And I'm here to talk about getting personal with your audience. And so uh, kind of take it back. I moved to New York City in 2003, and that's when I caught my big break. I had a little internship. It was about 30 days. And uh, basically what was happening is in the music industry, a lot of folks were sampling music. And uh, the kids that were placing beats on the big bad boy records, like Biggie's records, were unfortunately having to pay all of their royalties to the original copyright holders. And uh, even though they had big records on the radio, they weren't seeing a lot of royalties, right? And so there was a guy who was a producer for Puff Daddy and was looking for somebody who could actually play real chords and play real music instead of sampling so that he could actually get some money into his pocket when he got big records. And uh, that was me. And so uh, I was there for 30 days, and my first day of the internship, I kind of flew into New York City, picked me up in his big Mercedes Benz, and I went to his, his, uh, his, his place in the Bronx, his studio. I started to make some beats and everything, and like two hours into the process, he shut everything down and said, I'm going to be right back. And that really was like a huge change that happened in my life, because four hours later, he came back and said, hey, you know that little song that we were working on together? I played it for Puff, and he's working on the Bad Boys 2 movie soundtrack, and he just picked that music bed, that sound bed, for Beyonce. And I was like, oh, man, this is incredible. That was a Luck is opportunity meeting preparation. When I was at Harvard, I went in pre-med, and I changed my major to political science and macroeconomics, not because I thought that it was going to help me later on in life, but because it would allow me to take graduate school classes, take classes at the Kennedy School where I only had to show up to class once per semester and my entire grade was based on the final paper. So then that allowed me 40 hours a week to actually just do music. And so for years and years and years and years, I just did music, did music, did music, did music. And then all of a sudden at that one day in 2003, I think it was in March, my record turned into a Beyonce record. All the music I had done, preparation plus opportunity, that was my lucky day. But I started to understand and realize that monetization in music, the fight that that producer was fighting, was a fight that was only going to get more and more challenging. And I started to realize as well that the money that was being spent in the music industry to actually reach audiences was highly, highly, highly inefficient. And so after spending about two years 
under the wings of probably one of the most proficient marketers of all time, Puff Daddy, who was my manager, I signed my first artist, and I started to look at ways that new digital platforms would be able to break content, distribute content, ignite, activate audiences all around the world. And the platform at the time was MySpace. And so I put my girlfriend, well, my girlfriend was my first signee, and I put her, I created a MySpace profile. We did two or three songs, and we wanted to be able to cut through because MySpace was growing extremely rapidly, and everybody had a MySpace profile, at least, I mean, everyone was friends with Tom, at least, yeah. And so what happened was uh, we wanted to find a way to cut through, and uh, one of my buddies who was at UC Irvine said, hey, Ryan, I want you to check something out. He called me one morning and said, Ryan, I want you to check something out. And uh, I said, yeah, cool, what do you want me to check out? He says, I want you to Google the MySpace keyword. So I said, cool, I'll Google MySpace keyword. The first Google search result was MySpace.com. I said, okay, well, this isn't very interesting. I Googled MySpace, I got MySpace.com. He said, but I want you to look at two through 10 organic Google search results. And it happened to be like all my friends from college. I said, yo, this is crazy. Like, is Lex famous or something? He said, no, he's not famous, but we found a way that we can basically, through a series of like crazy link networks, we can control the MySpace keyword. And so I said, bro, um, you know, I just started my girl's MySpace profile. Like, can we do something with that? Like, is there something we could do with it? He said, yeah, uh, you know, let's try it out. And over the next 90 days, we took her MySpace profile from like 20 fans or 20 friends to 650,000 friends. And it was the first time in history where a song from MySpace went from zero to 200 plays to 2,000 plays to 20,000 plays a day. And not only did it go from that many plays per day, but it actually trickled over to terrestrial radio and was averaging about 2,000 spins a week on terrestrial radio. Now, to just put it in perspective, normally to get a record from zero to 2,000 spins on terrestrial radio in the traditional music industry trajectory costs you about 150 grand. And here we are, two kids and his girlfriend, who had actually made this happen for next to nothing. But something really insane happened probably about seven or eight months later. MySpace was no longer the cool platform. Right? So the equity that we had built through content, through media, through updates, through bulletins, through everything that we were doing, copywriting, everything, because I was masterminding and spingollying this entire project, immediately all of that equity just whoosh, evaporated. And I thought to myself, man, this is crazy. Like, you know, we did all this stuff. We, we basically reverse engineered how to get exposure. We built all the equity in the platform, and then all of a sudden it just evaporated. And then also, MySpace became more and more saturated. So more and more people were posting the same kinds of content. People started seeing, hey, if you want to get a lot of engagement and attraction, then maybe you should do what Ryan and Cassie are doing. One of the perfect case studies was Puff Daddy himself. He said, yo, what did you guys do to get from zero to 650,000 with Cassie? Could that actually work for somebody that already has a following? And the answer was yes. And so someone with that much celebrity lift ended up being, with our guidance, the number one fastest growing profile in MySpace history. But what does it mean today? Basically, peanuts, right? Because MySpace is no longer a platform where people are going to consume and engage with content and people. So I, the seed was planted then, and that was around, around 2007 when we started to, where we started to realize that, and the seed was planted. What would have happened if our audience wasn't actually owned by a third party platform. What, what would the difference be if the 650,000 friends that Cassie had was actually owned by Cassie? Well, you know, well, what does that even mean to own your audience? Well, I would say if you look in your phone book and you look at your contacts in your phone book, would you say that you own the relationships of the people that you could probably take out your phone and text? That's real ownership of a relationship, right? But would you say that you actually own the relationship with all the connections you have in LinkedIn? Probably not. Would you say that you own a relationship with everyone that's a friend of yours on Facebook? Probably not, right? And so the idea here about getting personal is about audience ownership. And when you have audience ownership, what you start seeing is really amazing engagement, 
really amazing conversion, really amazing loyalty, really amazing relationship building. And so that's the concept behind Superphone. And so I actually, after we put out Cassie's record, she was the first artist in the history of social media and probably only artist in the history of social media who had a significant number of followers, over 500,000, who sold as many records as she had social media followers. 650,000 on MySpace, 650,000 records worldwide. Probably won't ever happen again. If you look at Justin Bieber or if Kendall Jenner tomorrow were to put out an album, would she sell 55 million records because she has 55 million followers? Probably not. Actually, all of you guys as marketers in the room probably understand that when you have a huge social following, you're lucky if you get 1% conversion. You're lucky if you get 0.01% conversion. If you get to Oprah level, 31.2 million Twitter followers, you could probably look at her last tweet and she has 400 retweets or 200 likes. What happened to the other 31 million people who are following her, right? And so I put out a record. I got signed, I put out a record on a major, sold 180,000 copies. We put out my second record, we sold 60,000 copies. And I went into the marketing department at my record label and I said, how come the first line of offense for my second album wasn't to just send an email to everybody who bought my first record? There's 180,000 people who liked my music. We spent all kinds of money to market to those people. We spent all kinds of money to activate them, get them excited about me. 180,000 people converted. They spent money. Why wasn't our first line of offense for marketing my second album to just send an email to everybody? Because I'm sure they would have loved to know that I had an album. And they just kind of scratched their heads and said, well, we, we don't know who bought your album. So what do you mean? Like, we're in a digital age. It's 20, 2010. Like, you don't know who actually bought my record directly? Well, no, it's, uh, it's, uh, we mostly sell like, through retailers like Target and Walmart. And you know, it's kind of like a, you know, they, they, they get 7,000 and 10,000. And then a lot of the other records were sold on iTunes. And I said, well, why can't we just I ask iTunes? They, they have all email. I have an email. I have an Apple ID. Why can't we just ask them? Who bought my album so I could actually market to them again, let them know? And they said, well, you know, uh, it, it's, a, it's a closed uh, environment. They, they won't give us the data. I said, well, that's, uh, that seems highly inefficient uh, for someone or a company to whom I've entrusted my life as a creator, right? And so in 2010, I actually wrote a check and bought myself out of my record contract, because I thought that there had to be a better way. And I started to build on the social platforms that were out. I had 550,000 followers on Twitter. I got 220,000 followers on Instagram. I got 450,000 followers on Facebook, or likes on Facebook. But what I was realizing is that if my future was to eventually, if my dream was to eventually get to Oprah level and have 31 million followers, and my engagement at that level was going to be 0.00001%. Is that really what I wanted to, is that really the place to which I wanted to aspire? And I realized, no, that's not really the place to which I want to aspire. What I really want to aspire to is owning my audience, owning my relationship with my audience. And so at the time, I didn't know exactly how I was going to do it, but it started with me thinking, what would I say to every single person in my audience if I had the opportunity to just sit down with them and have their attention for two seconds on their mobile device? And I thought to myself, well, what I would want to say is just, thanks for supporting me. I thought if I started there, that would actually change my whole life. And so I put my phone number my real cell phone number, that was probably not very smart, but put my real cell phone number on Twitter. And if you go on Twitter right now, at Ryan Leslie, look at it, you'll see that it says, rarely on Twitter, always on my cell, and then my cell phone number, that's the banner of my actual Twitter profile. And uh, the text just started coming in, crazy. All kinds of texts from all over the world. Ryan, I've been a number one fan. Yo, can you sing at my wedding? Yo, can I borrow $50,000? Know, yo, can you fund my college education? All kinds of stuff was happening, right? Yo, can you sign me? Can you give you a deal? Listen to my beats. So much inbound information 
And I realized that I needed a platform, I needed a system that was gonna allow me, number one, because this was invaluable data, right? It's like sentiment analysis. What do my fans actually think about me, right? I know I could probably turn on the Twitter fire hose and see what everyone is saying about me in, in case they ever at me on Twitter, what they're saying about me. But the beauty of this is what are they saying actually to me when they have the ability to talk to me. And so we built this platform called Superphone. And the, the very, very simple premises behind Superphone is the ability to actually have a real relationship with every one of my social media followers that's actually interested in a real relationship with me. So of the 220,000 Instagram followers that I have, 46,000 of them have actually taken out their mobile device, typed in my phone number, and for whatever reason, maybe they think it's a novelty, maybe they do really want to connect with me, they actually send me that first text. And when you send me that first text, my system is smart enough to say, I don't recognize this number. Can you add your info to my phone? That's step one. I'm interested in actually extracting as much precision data around my audience as possible. Number one, first name, last name, zip code, email. That's what's required. And then there's additional information they can give me. Birthday, Twitter, Instagram, job, company, of the 46,000 people who texted me, 41,000 opted into filling out the form. Of the 41,000 who opted into filling out the form, eight out of 10 gave me all the additional information. Of the eight out of 10 who gave me all the additional information, four, which is almost 50%, one out of every two who actually gave me all their information actually spent some money with me. Of the people who spent money with me, the top 500, and I think it, it took me about six months to do about $570,000 direct to consumer, no label, no manager, no PR, no music videos, straight off the iPhone, $570,000. The top 500 spent 150,000 of the top, of the, of the 570,000. And so, I mean, these, these numbers just, just, they just were, mind-boggling to me because I had learned everything you're supposed to learn about email marketing. I learned everything that you're supposed to learn about marketing automation. I learned everything you're supposed to learn about email automation chains, following up, how to craft the perfect email, how to, you know, what your subject line should be, A-B testing on email, all this kind of stuff I had read, taught myself, and then I realized that just a very simple conversion, and this is exactly what my phone system does every single time someone texts me. First, would you like to give me your information? Second, would you like to get my album? Third, when you get my album, five minutes later, yo, what's up, it's Ryan, man. I saw you just got my album five minutes ago. Thank you so much. I'm gonna shoot you a text when I'm in your city to perform and I'll keep you updated with everything I'm doing. Crazy, crazy, crazy conversion that started to happen. And so, really, um, we got about 10 minutes, 11 minutes left and uh, Normally at this point in the presentation, people's brains are churning about, okay, you know, is, is this scalable to like, you know, millions of people? We don't really know yet, it's a startup. Uh, but I do know for sure that beyond just being able to track people by how much they've spent with me. So I can go on my phone right now and tell you my number two fan in the world is Christopher Ingebrigtsen. He lives in Oslo, Norway. He works at the equivalent of a Kinko's. He spent $4,000 with me in the last year. What has he spent it on? Well, I did a sneaker collaboration. He bought two of those at 270 bucks a piece. I did a shades collaboration. He bought a pair of those at 195 bucks. I also now distribute my music one song at a time every month for the rest of my life. Because I'm like, well, if I actually know everyone who's interested in getting my music, I can invest money trying to grow my audience, but for the actual audience that I do have, why not just have them in a recurring environment and they can just choose how much they think my song is worth every month. And so I have about 8,000 people and they pick the number between $1 and 100 bucks for every time I text them a song. So every month I text them a song and their credit card, based on my system, is already on file, and it's automatically charged whenever I text them a song. And I'm very 
polite and very respectful. I don't sex in eight songs, right? Um, but Christopher Ingebrigtsen sent me a text when I put this idea out, and he said, Ryan, I was waiting for the moment that I could actually show you that I want to ride with you for life. I think your songs are worth 100 bucks. I've been doing this for nine months, every single month, nine months straight, $100 a song every time I text him a song. This is the power of owning your audience. This is the power of owning the relationship that you have with your audience. So, you know, how does this actually apply to like content creators? How does this actually apply to large scale content aggregators? Well, one of our investors, and we've raised a pretty crazy seed round, um, Ben Horowitz from Andreessen Horowitz. I, I, how did I get a meeting with Ben Horowitz from Andreessen Horowitz? Uh, well, actually, his entrepreneur in residence saw my cell phone on Twitter and was like, ah, this can't be a real, this can't be really Ryan's cell phone. He went through the entire process. He bought my album. Five minutes later, he got a text saying thank you and said, holy moly, this is crazy. This is the only time that I've ever bought an album from somebody that I really admire that I got an actual thank you text. You need to beat Ben Horowitz. I was like, who is Ben Horowitz, right? <laughs> but what happened is, it started to actually, now that I actually know everyone that's in my phone book, I can start to do really amazing things. I can actually automate, when someone retweets me, I can send them a text. Yo, I saw you just retweeted me. Thanks a lot for the support. Someone likes my Instagram uh, picture. Yo, thanks a lot for the like, man. I appreciate that. That actually encourages them to do more of that behavior, become more evangel evangelical of uh, the content that I'm posting. And... Um, what I really just started to learn is that your life really can change when you actually know and can track how often you're engaging with people. And so one of my favorite metrics in Superphone is most contacted this week, right? And so uh, I'm crazy enough that my Superphone number is actually my real cell phone number, right? So that's the same way my mom reaches me, the same way my girl reaches me, the same way my number one fan reaches me, the same way Jesse K or any of the people who are organizing at DigiDay reach me. It's all the same phone number. But week over week, it'll tell me who I'm contacting the most. And if I'm very, very, very focused on doing something crazy like giving an incredible viewer or fan experience, I'll find that the people I'm contacting the most are people who are going to engage at that event. Case in point, one of the most insane events I ever threw is I know everybody in my audience that has a tolerance for spending more than 100 bucks with me in the course of a year. So my idea was, OK, would they actually spend 1,000 bucks? Would they actually spend 2,000 bucks? So I put together an insane experience. We got a castle in Vienna, Austria for New Year's Eve. And everyone who had actually spent more than 100 bucks with me that year, I sent them a text and said, look, this year's New Year's is going to be second to none. It's going to be unbelievable. It's going to be insane. I have a castle in Vienna, Austria. It's going to be our castle on New Year's Eve. The tickets are 1700 bucks. What do you guys think? 48 hours later, we'd sold out every single ticket. People flew from Detroit. People flew from uh, Northern Africa. People flew from the UK. People flew from Germany. People flew from California, New York City, all to turn up with me on New Year's Eve at 1700 bucks a ticket, right? And it was a badge of honor. And we did audience interviews after the experience and say, hey, guys, you know, what do you think about this? Was it, was it worth it? Oh, if I could, yo, I would have paid more. This was incredible. Ryan hung out with me. So of course, we took that market research and raised prices the, the next year. And uh, I think we'll continue to have an upward trajectory in terms of income. Um, but, but really, I think as folks who are marketers, as folks who are content creators, as folks who care about the stars and the writers and the creators that are putting this content together, as folks that care about messaging, as folks that care about being on brand and making sure that the incredible content that you actually create is reaching people and converting and being shared and activating the audiences and the core audiences that you've invested so much in building. I don't know if I have all the answers. I know that I found an answer that worked for me and it's just about, number one, owning my relationship, being respectful, and engaging with them on a level that they want to be engaged with with me, and also creating experiences offline when it actually makes sense for them to actually engage with each other and 
become more, I guess, uh, how should I say, uh, to become more uh, deeply engaged, if you will, and to actually just feel like I really acknowledge and appreciate them for their support of my content, for the support of my creativity, and for their support of my career. Yeah. I'm Ryan Leslie. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. For once, I'm not the best looking man on stage. Uh, <laughs> That was, that, was, that was a great session, Ryan. Thank you uh, thank so you for, much. Thank you for being here. Uh, one of the things I want to ask you, uh, in terms of how you look at all of these different platforms that you're on, of course, sort of, not just with Superphone, but also the broader platforms. When you, when someone communicates with you from, on, a, on a broader platform, like a, an Instagram, and then it gets a little bit more personal, how, how does that change the relationship, you would say, in terms of going from somewhere where it's just very broad and like broadcast oriented to something that's really one-to-one? -one? Yeah, um, well, I mean, when you're, when I'm thinking about communicating one-to-one, -one, it's, it's, it's an entirely different, you, you have to think about it yeah. differently, right? Yeah. So even like with an email, people just know when the email is a mass email. Even if you put like the F name tag and it says, hey, yeah. say your name again? Sahil. Hey, Sahil, yeah. uh, you know, I have this new video you should check out. Um, everything changes on text for me. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's interesting. Like, uh, we had this, I literally had this just now. If you look at my last Instagram post, mm -hmm. there's some guy who, you know, the, my last Instagram post says, hey, I'm in Miami, text me. You know, go figure, right? Mm -hmm. um, and some guy left a comment and was just like, yo, man, you know, you're selling out. I know you're just collecting data so you could sell it to, like, brands, right? But he actually texted me this, right? <laughs> he texted me this, and then not only did he text me this, but he also left it as a comment, right? Mm -hmm. Yo, Ryan, you're a sellout, right? And so he was just like, man, you know, and he got the initial auto response and said, hey, you know, I don't recognize this number, who are you, right? And I kind of scrolled through so I can see when these red flags are going off, right? Mm -hmm. and, um, and he says, well, I was expecting something more personal. And I said, well, this is the same phone number that my mom uses. And he was like, holy moly, this is crazy. And he went right back on Instagram and said, hey, I checked out Ryan's thing. This is so awesome. It's real. And so um, it's, it's really interesting. I yeah. mean, I don't think that that, that specific experience can be uh, necessarily scaled. Mm -hmm. But I do believe that with artificial intelligence and machine learning, I can take the 46 or 47,000 conversations that I'm having via Superphone, mm -hmm. put them in a machine, synthesize what everyone really wants to know. When are you performing next? When's your next project? When are you dropping your next video on YouTube? Mm -hmm. Yo, uh, who else can you introduce? What so-and-so Snap channel? Whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And I can actually create responses in my voice that are actually going to feel organic and will be in my voice and will be the same way that I will communicate with someone one-to-one. -one. I mean, you just have to think about it. Like, if all of you guys all texted me right now, I would love to know every single one of you. It's literally humanly impossible. The science says, if you listen to Robin Dunbar, you can only maintain 150 relationships at any given point in your life anyway. 150 even just sounds crazy, mm -hmm. right? But if you, if each and every one of you actually bought my album, I do want to say thank you, personally, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's beautiful that technology can actually enable that level of personal communication and it's beautiful that SMS and messaging gives you a platform to actually have that personal communication. And so uh, I think it's really just about, um, it's really about creating content, very short bite-sized content that's, that's personal mm -hmm. as opposed to uh, one to many, if you will. One of the conversations we've been having uh, in terms of like the way people look at platforms is worrying about not giving up too much control to yeah. the platform, right? And yeah. you talked a little bit about this in your, in your presentation. What would you say then, um, the value is in, 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 in these social platforms. If, if the idea is always to actually have a more ownership over the relationship you have with your audience, that's great. But what's the value then in, in an Instagram, in a Twitter, in, a, in Facebook, and all these other platforms? Yeah, well, I, I would say that these are not social communication platforms. They're social media platforms. So you allow for a community to be built around the media that you're creating. You mm -hmm. allow for discovery. You mm -hmm. allow for sharing. You allow for evangelism. You allow for discussion. Mm -hmm. So every single platform is almost the same. Put up the YouTube video. There's likes. There's dislikes. Mm -hmm. There's ability to share. And then there's, a, there's an entire discussion that's happening. Mm -hmm. Very rarely 
does someone who leaves a comment on a YouTube video mm -hmm. feel like that comment will actually reach the creator? Especially in the case of like a brand situation, right? Um, maybe if I'm an actual vlogger and all I do is say, hey, I'm gonna read some comments today and respond to them, mm -hmm. maybe there's, there's some training of the audience that actually says, okay, this is how I can interact. Mm -hmm. The ownership of the relationship, the ownership of the audience is something that I believe as content creators, as marketers, we need to start looking at more and more because the platforms are already built. We're not going to build a, a photo distribution platform. We're not going to build a video distribution platform. We're not going to build a, a, a live broadcast video distribution platform. Those platforms are built. They've already been adopted. Mm -hmm. there's, there's audiences that are and communities that have been built. And uh, I think that the actual platforms in and of themselves are, are vehicles and are vehicles to actually grow the audience that eventually you can own. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we have a, a, a little bit of time just for a yeah. couple of audience questions if anyone's interested. Uh, anyone? Right here. Uh, yeah. One second. Uh, let's grab this. I can talk loud also. Yeah. Okay, let's just do that. So I just signed up on your website for the beta. <laughs> I want to start using it right now. Yes. Uh, Yeah, so, um, so uh, that's a great question. <laughs> so uh, like I said, I, I literally built this myself uh, in 2013 in my boxers and a bunch of like Chinese food for like 60 days. I taught myself how to code on Code Academy to build the first instance of this. Um, and then uh, we just raised like kind of a pretty large bridge seed round and uh, we were uh, charged by our investors to close down the beta. And so I'll tell you why. We, we initially brought on about 2,500 users, and they were users across literally every vertical. So it went from like a personal trainer that wanted to be able to text with all their clients to you know a jewelry designer to a cupcake maker to a, you know someone that was actually a, had their own like livery service and didn't want to do it through Uber, so people could just text them. There all kinds of you know ways that people. I mean, I'll tell you even a, a more crazy um, a more crazy uh, use case. So. A professional athlete was posted on an extremely widely followed Instagram profile as a Man Crush Monday. Okay, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the hashtag Man Crush Monday. It's where a girl posts a guy that's really cute on their Instagram profile. It just so happened that this girl has like 25 million Instagram followers. This professional athlete was somewhat unknown, but his Instagram DMs like went insane, right? And basically, he was like, wow, this is amazing. Now I have all this inbound, uh, you know, all these women that would love to know who I am, sure, et cetera. Sure. But when he would go to away games, it was just like impossible. He's like, oh, I landed in Texas, but I can't really, I don't know which of the, these girls that are in my DMs would like to like have dinner with me before the game, go out, whatever. And so he just started giving his super phone number out, and it basically organized all of his inbound. And so like whenever he lands in DC or Atlanta or Florida, or whatever, he can literally just press a button and text everybody, hey, what's up, babe? I'm I'm in town, but it's all personal, right? So so these are I think it gets more personal. Yeah, yeah, than yeah. That. But but these are getting like these are like the wide range of use cases. So basically right now, um, Right now, our pricing is we just we we we, we charge in two ways. Um, if you look at the traditional email marketing model, you pay based on your subscriber, the size of your subscriber base, um, and then you also basically pay for the intelligence on top of the messaging. So we're built on a platform called Twilio. Twilio is the same messaging platform that Airbnb and Uber uses. So like when your Uber driver's outside and text you, hey, I'm around the corner, you find each other, you can call each other, but it's not his phone number, it's not your phone number, right? Um, so we're built, we're, we're built on that. They charge domestically in the United States about a, you know, about seven, seven tenths of a penny or a half, half of a penny per text message. We add a premium on top for all the intelligence. So to give you an idea, to do half a million dollars in revenue, it took me 250,000 text messages, which is about 2,500 bucks. So that's a crazy ROI, right? Um, when will we be open again? Uh, right now, we're looking for the right case studies, if you will. So we kind of had a free for all already, and you know there were a few, you know, cool examples of how this can be applied to beyond just a celebrity or influencer. Um, but our investors are very, very interested right now, and, and so, you know, 
to this room, I will be in LA on the 26th and 27th talking to Warner Television. They have 70 shows. They're wondering whether or not, you know, this is, could be something cool and could scale to Ellen, the Ellen show, right? Um, I've had four meetings with Oprah, so they're wondering whether or not this could work for people losing weight with Oprah on Weight Watchers, et cetera. And so we'll build different pricing for those enterprise level uh, activations, but we really want to dig in right now, roll up our sleeves and figure out um, what the actual ROI and value is and we'll price accordingly. But we're, we're a startup, so. That's how it works. Yep. Right, uh, we got to keep the show going, but that was great. Thanks so much for being on stage. Thanks and talking to everyone. Thanks so much. And I'll, I'll, I'll say this. Go ahead. No, don't do it. Yeah, no, yeah, I'll say this. Um, my phone number. <laughs> Seriously. Uh, so for anybody that didn't get a chance to link up and, and had more questions or would like to explore how this could work for them, for their content strategy, et cetera, my number is 646-887. 6978. And the easiest way to do this is not to write it down. Don't add me to your contacts, but just go to your messenger, messenger, your text messenger, create a new message, 646-887-6978, and just say Digi Day uh, and your name, and I will know everyone that I met at Digi. I'll literally look at my phone in five minutes and I'll say, oh, I met 30 people after my Digi Day talk. It's pretty insane. You guys, if you ever do any public speaking or come to conferences, it definitely beats like business card exchanges because <laughs> you literally just say, hey, text me. The phone hits them back and says, give me your info. When they submit it, your V card is added to their device and literally, I mean, I think there've been a lot of platforms that like mm -hmm. bump and things like that, but this has been super efficient. So once again, my number is 646-887. Six nine seven eight. Thank you guys so much. I'm Ryan Leslie. Great. Thanks, Thanks, All right, we're gonna keep the show 